Welcome to Making Change Radio here on Radio Fairfax. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and tonight we're talking with Corey Trench. Corey is the president of Hope Family Village, which is located in Williamsburg, Virginia. He is the co-founder of a foundation that supports this housing, that supports those who are challenged with mental health issues and also their families and caregivers. Thank you so much, Corey, for being here. I think this is a topic that is going to interest our listeners. Yes, thank you very much for having me, Catherine. So we ended up meeting because the League of Women Voters asked us to be on a panel this past Saturday about behavioral health issues. And it was very intriguing that the League of Women Voters has an interest and has been advocating for behavioral health issues, but also they want to take a deeper interest in in practical ways in which they can advocate for those living with mental illness all across the Commonwealth of Virginia. And so you were one of the panelists, I was the moderator, and we had Senator Monty Mason on, and I want you to talk a little bit later in the show about how Senator Mason has factored into your efforts. Right. But let's start But let's start with your story, which is how you came to be a man who started a village. <laughs> That's a good way to introduce it. Well, I didn't know that mental illness was a problem. Uh, I, I sort of look at myself as sort of the average man in America uh, who reads the newspaper, listens to the radio, uh, watches television, and never had an inkling that mental illness was so per pervasive in our society until it affected our family. And I suspect with many illnesses, uh, we become very involved as individuals and as family when it affects us personally. And 10 years ago, my son, my youngest son of three sons, I have three sons, uh, was a senior in college, ready to become an engineer. And he had a psychotic break. And part of his psychotic break uh, we, and we really didn't even know it was a psychotic break. I mean, you find these things out months and months and months later that this is what was going on. Um, he, uh, he tried to commit suicide. And I think this is something that we're, 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 we're reluctant to talk about, but it, it happens in our society. And I think with COVID, it's become a lot more uh, known. Uh, this is going on with extreme isolation. But because of what happened to him, uh, I probably spent the first two or three years meandering around trying to find out what, what was mental illness, how do you interact with the uh, mental health system to get support for a loved one, really trying to understand what his future might look like. And in that process, I ran into an organization called the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI. And it was really the beginning of my realization, and it's very important uh, for all caregivers to realize that they're not alone, and when I found out that I was not alone, it wasn't very long before I realized that I was gonna become an advocate for other people, not just my son. And um, I think uh, this, was, this was kind of a key thing of me becoming a man who uh, was gonna start a village as I, I realized that there were many people uh, like me that were caregivers that were seeking solutions for their sons and daughters and, uh, you know, and our idea was, well, the caregivers need to, to step forward and, and be involved in, in seeking that solution. So that's, that's really how I got in, involved and was motivated to, to start doing something. You know, it's interesting how we live in a parallel universe and you and I were both at a NAMI conference in Washington, D.C. at the same time. We were the there at the same time. event <laughs> because Senator Cree Deeds was being given an award. And mm -hmm. for those who may not be familiar with the Deeds Commission, which was set up after the tragic death of his son, Gus, um, mm -hmm. the Deeds Commission has done a lot to try to shine a light on the tremendous deficits and gaps we are experiencing in the Commonwealth of Virginia um, in trying to create stable, safe environments not just for people in crisis. And that's why I think, you know, you, you talk about your son had a psychotic break and there's this initial, you need a bed. And so the Deeds mm -hmm. Commission, the first, the first thing they accomplished was an electronic bed register because his son had been turned away. They couldn't find mm -hmm. a bed for him. 
-hmm. And it was all done manually. It was all done by telephone. You called and you said, do you have a bed? No, we don't have a bed. And so people in crisis were being turned away. But beyond the crisis situation, people need to move to stability and sustainability. And that's where you came into this saying, okay, once, once the crisis has passed, how do you support people living with mental illness challenges in an environment where they can thrive? Mm-hmm. And, you know, and you're just, you're an, like you said, you're an engineer. You're not a <laughs> mental health professional, but you're no. a parent. And isn't it amazing how parents can like get up to speed really fast when <laughs> they have to? So that's right. And then that, and then we all have certain knowledge, uh, talents and skills and experience that we've accumulated, you know, over our careers. And in my case, you know, I was retired. I, I, I had finished my career, but, and, uh, and my area was environmental science and, and, and energy, but I quickly, uh, noticed that, wow, uh, there's a lot that I, I could offer, uh, to a subject matter that I knew nothing about. Uh, and it's the same old uh, situation when you're going in to solve a problem, you, you do a deep dive into everything you can get your hands on, you, uh, you're insatiable uh, for uh, uh, reading materials, listening to shows, watching movies, talking to people. And so I was accumulating all this information. The best source of information though, was in my family caregiver group. And at NAMI Williamsburg, we meet on a weekly basis and caregivers come in and uh, sort of uh, in crisis or uh, updating the situation with their loved one. And in that process, uh, this is where uh, the idea emerged that uh, one woman uh, who recently passed, and and it's sad for me because we we lose people along the way that we work with that we care very deeply about as caregivers or, or loved ones. And she, she, she remarked uh, uh, during the session, couldn't we all just get together and buy a home? And, and that became the beginning of, well, you know, what a naive thing to do. We're all going to buy a home and we're going to, you know, ship our kids to this and they're going to live together and, and we're going to go on living, living our lives happily ever after and so will they. You know, well, but what a brilliant uh, comment, though, because... And this is this is something that you were saying earlier. We were talking about in our panel is every community, every neighborhood has someone there that lives with a mental illness. It can be of varying degrees, and and it's in our communities. So we are the source of the solution. We're the closest to the need. We're the closest to the problem. So why not see if we couldn't develop our own solution? And so that idea of a home for me got expanded to somebody said, well, you know, we have this Eastern state surplus property that they've been trying to sell. Why are they not using this for behavioral health? And, and some of my fellow um, uh, support group members would <laughs> look at me and say, Corey, you've got to do something about this. Like, I'm going to go into the state and I'm going to get a sliver of property and we're going to build a project. Well, so we thought about this for a second. We thought, okay, so we're, we have a piece of property that's available. Um, what will we do with it? And uh, we started to cobble together a vision and the vision looked something like this. And it was addressing all the needs of our loved ones. One of them was access to care. Uh, this is what uh, loved ones and parents want in the worst kind of way, universally. They want access to somebody who's gonna care about them and provide them the services that they need. Surprisingly, and maybe not so, they want to work just like anybody else. They want to realize value and meaning in their life, and that's associated with a job. And many of our people would start work and they'd quit within a day. Why? Why wasn't it working out? What about the work wasn't good? So we thought that our property should have access to care. You could walk to work. So imagine a place where um, maybe you're constructing uh, something or you're, you're, you're a, an Amazon site bundling together things, but you have a place to work and then you needed a place to live. So we imagined uh, a community in which peers live together and develop their own rules and, and would kind of be accountable to each other within that. And then the final aspect of our vision was we all want to learn. We all want to develop new skills, no matter what they are. So we thought we've got a community college here and the College of William Mary is here. Maybe there was some way that we could provide education. 
But what was going to tie all this together was a coach. It occurred to us that we were the enemies of our children and not necessarily not on purpose. You know, we're trying to help our kids, right? But the reality is they really don't want to hear from us. And and how typical is that anyways? <laughs> well, you, you you've hit on the very thing, which is you cannot mentor your own child. I've got three, yeah. I've got three of them in their thirties and I figured out early on, you know, I can coach other people's children and I do, I have mentored so many young people, so many, but not my own because it won't mm. work. Mm. For those of you who are just joining us, this is making change radio here on radio Fairfax. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. And we're talking with Corey Trench. He is the president and founder of hope family village. And we're talking about supported housing for people struggling with mental illness. So you're absolutely right that, you know, what you're talking about constructing is not just the housing piece, but the critical piece is the support piece. Mm -hmm. the, the, you know, the, the, the sort of the safety network of how, when you need help, it, 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 probably even the lowest level. In other words, it's not a crisis. It might be a problem on the job. It might just be, it mm -hmm. might just be that you had a bad day and you need to work through it. So where is the safety network of people that are readily available? To so you? this is so this is a really uh, good topic for us to talk about, because you probably heard the term. The best psychiatrist is a friend. And many of our loved ones had lost all their friends over the course of their illness for one reason or another. And really what they wanted was a friend. And so what you were talking about being a mentor, they just needed someone else that was not their parent, probably not their friend, to listen to them as a friend would. And so this is one of the things that I learned from being involved in NAMI. While I was associating with many of our caregivers, I got to know our corresponding peer group who were people living with mental illness. And there were two guys that I visited for one year and I saw them every week. And they told me about their lives. They were older gentlemen uh, who had experience, lived experience with their mental illness. And um, I got to know them as their friend. And they would tell me about their experience. And I didn't put any judgment on it. I just would listen to what they had to say. And this is where the idea sort of came to me that here we are as boomers, our generation. Our generation has enjoyed incredible success and prosperity in our careers and our families. We've seen our kids go on to college and start to make their way. And it occurred to me that what we had to offer was our time and our treasure. This is, this is what we, we have. I mean, our accumulated experience, and it might be as simple as listening to somebody else who's really struggling and, and giving them sort of a mirror to reflect on and, and to help them in some way. So, so this is where the coaching element started to become a really important part of the foundation of what I thought we needed to do. Uh, and, and we are getting to housing because that is important. Uh, you know, I would say one of the common um, comments, both for caregivers and loved ones, is they want to live in a safe place with the emphasis on the word safety. And so, uh, you know, that... Uh, this, this started to become my quest to find, imagine what I, I wanted to do and then to figure out how could we start, start doing something. Well, you bring up something complicated and that's the idea of safety. And it is very complicated because a lot of people, when they hear that someone has mental illness, they conceive that that person is dangerous. And mm -hmm. it doesn't help that we have had examples, for instance, of school shooters where a young man usually has had a psychotic break of some kind and becomes violent. But that is such a tiny infinitesimal percentage of people with mental illness. Most people with mental illness are not, they're not dangerous. They are more likely to be victims. Mm -hmm. A lot of people currently are, who are homeless suffer from mental illness. Our jails and prisons are filled with people who have mental illness. and. And so when you talk about creating supported com community housing, there's gonna be a certain amount of nimbyism that says, oh yes, yes, we should definitely have a safe place for people who wanna be productive members of our society. They should have jobs and they should have housing, but not necessarily in my neighborhood. Mm -hmm. So this is true. So uh, we had a, a case here in Williamsburg and it was very visible 
uh, an organization was going to uh, rent a home in right in the heart of the city uh, for a, a group home. And there were gonna be eight people moving from uh, Eastern State Hospital into this home. They were gonna have 24 seven care. And when the neighborhood found out about it, they just, they were in an uproar. Um, and just the idea of that would be revolting to those of us that are caregivers and know that the people that we work with, that the, it's the case that they're more afraid of society than harmful to society. It's the exact opposite, as you were saying. And so uh, it, it sort of, but it was interesting. The incident gave us the idea, well, if we can't live in a neighborhood, well, why can't we have our own neighborhood? And so this is what, you know, we proposed to, initially it was Senator Norman, uh, I'd given a, a, a speech to the Shrine Club and they asked if I, if I was interested in meeting with Senator Norman. I said, well, I'd love to talk to him about, you know, what we're doing. And I, and I made a case for if you, just like that, if you couldn't have a, you couldn't live in a neighborhood and you had to fight off stigma and everything else and convince everybody that everything was fine, why don't we just build a neighborhood and we'll put our caregivers in there and we'll put our loved ones in there and we will at least start at step one, we understand each other. We accept each other. We expect that things are going to happen and that we're going to help each other. Very simple idea. And he actually thought this was an interesting, um, you know, approach. And I said, well, it's actually modeled after something called co-housing. And this was originated in Denmark and it's been brought to the United States uh, by a couple of architects some years ago now. And there are around 200 co-housing communities in America. And, and they push forth the idea or advance the idea that rather than build a house for yourself, why not, if a group of people wanted to build a neighborhood, how would you do that? And, and their comment, what, what holds them together or binds them is they're, and, and you would never live in this neighborhood if you weren't willing to do this, is that you're willing to help your neighbor very simple idea. If, they, if they, they need sugar, you're going to provide them some sugar. If they need a ride to the doctor, somebody in the community is going to provide a ride. And, that, and they built uh, neighborhoods out of this of 25 to uh, 30, 30 units where they had a common denominator. And so that was kind of what our idea was. Well, we have a common denominator. It's that we're caregivers or we're living with a mental illness. And this is the safe place that we'd like to have where we could mutually support one another. This sounds very Danish indeed. <laughs> <laughs> For those of you who are just joining us, this is Making Change Radio here on Radio Fairfax. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. And we're talking with Corey Trench, who is busy putting together the Hope Family Village in Williamsburg to support those living with mental illness and their caregivers. So it does sound a bit utopian, and yet clearly it demonstrably works. So you came upon this fair weather lodge concept and thought this is the answer, yes? Well, so I had my vision. I knew about co-housing previously. I, I just thought it was a, a fantastic idea and I had visited communities and actually my son came to visit me for you with me, uh, a, a community in New Hampshire before he had his break. And, and we both thought, well, hey, this is kind of a neat place to live. So we had our vision. And then um, I happened to run into a friend of mine who I hadn't seen in 40 years. Uh, we both attended the College of William and Mary together and we're, we're good friends, used to ride our bikes together. And I was laying this vision out to him, knowing that he had graduated in, in family therapy uh, from the college. And uh, he said, well, it's already been done. And, uh, and, and as with all things, we have a hard time finding people that are just like us out there. The internet is a wonderful tool, but it's very difficult. It's still very difficult to find people that are, that are working on the same problems we are. And I said, well, what do you mean by this? And uh, he said, well, when I graduated uh, with my degree, I moved to Austin, Texas, and I became a coordinator for something called a Fairweather Lodge. And he says, I don't know whether the organization is still around or not because he had moved on in his career, but I'll send you some links and I'll see if I can accomplish an, an introduction. And uh, so he described, you know, basically what it was, people living together in a house who were accountable to one another, made sure they were on their medications. Work was essential as far as, you know, what they, uh, they did. Uh, you had to work, you had to volunteer, 
they were mutually supportive. And so he made an introduction to me uh, about the same time that you were, you and I were at the conference in, in Washington, D.C. And uh, I wound up going up to uh, visit an agency in uh, Pennsylvania and went around to uh, four Fairweather Lodges in a matter of two or three days. And I knew I'd found an answer. It's, it's not for everyone, but I realized that exactly what we were talking about is what uh, these folks were doing. You know, and it's interesting how you do, like we were connected through the League of Women Voters. And so I didn't know who you were and I'd never heard of Hope Family Village. But then as we have gotten to know each other, I introduced you to the Brain Foundation, mm -hmm. which has also been doing this. Uh, Trudy Harsh is the founder. I interviewed her back in 2017. And basically she is doing, she is another parent who mm -hmm. started Laura's houses and they are still managing this housing that supports people living with mental illness. And so there's, there's a model that Trudy just came up with on her own. Mm -hmm. And, you know, and she put together volunteers. It's an all volunteer organization. She's yep. got a board of directors. She's got volunteer property managers. She's got collaborations with people who provide mental health services. But, you know, it does make you wonder or to ask the question, what are communities doing around the Commonwealth of Virginia when we all acknowledge that there are people living amongst us who have this challenge and the, it either falls on the family to figure out how to support their loved one, or oftentimes they end up homeless or they end up incarcerated, mm -hmm. which should, should create a sense of urgency about why every community should be asking, where are these people in our community and, and what are we doing? Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it's funny. If everybody had one member in their family that was dealing with mental illness and, and just a sliver of what somebody with a serious mental illness goes through and the diagnosis that goes along with that, they, they'd say, yes, we need to do something. But because it, it doesn't hit them as hard, uh, you know, as a family or as an individual, we just don't think about it. And then I think the other thing that we realized in, in our group here was that if we were going to wait for the government to come up with supportive housing in our community, we're gonna be waiting a very long time. Uh, because the need is so great. And I think people have no idea what the numbers are of people that need a safe place to live, have loved ones that would like to work and would like to have a friend. I mean, just very simple stuff. And, uh, and so we were going to have to do something about it. But I think too often uh, we, we look to our federal, our state, uh, even our local government as, well, they've got to come up with a solution. And so what we determined was, and, and I listened to the interview with, with Trudy, and, and, and I, I sent out a note to my board directors, this is a, a person we need to make a road trip to visit with, because she's, she's ahead of us in some respects. You know, We might have the model of Fairweather Lodge, which she might be interested in, but it, it comes down to us to, to think about what we might do and to work with possibly other organizations. So, um, uh, I've been talking to churches and churches are very involved in the homeless. And so if they're working with the homeless then they're also working with mental illness. So locally uh, here we have House of Mercy and they've done a fantastic job of addressing both housing for the homeless and um, other care, case management support services. So we sort of found somebody that uh, would understand what we were doing. And we said, well, we, we have sort of an adaptation that we think might be useful to you. And I think if you start building what it is that you want to see, it's going to be a lot easier for our local government, our state government, or our federal government to see, well, this looks like a cost-effective mechanism for caring for people. Why don't we start supporting them rather than the reverse? Because I think the reverse is a very difficult problem to solve. Uh, you may have heard, that, well, heard me mention to um, Monty Mason, if we saw it, said to ourselves, $50 a day to care for a person 365 days a year, and we thought of the numbers of people that needed the kind of care that we were talking about, we're talking about a half a trillion dollars per year. Well, that becomes such a daunting figure that it paralyzes us. We think we can't do anything. And I think this is one of the things that I've discovered that I've, I've shared with you and the panel is there was lots that we could do. Uh, we just had to open our minds and say, what is the first thing we do that costs us the least amount of money that we can start to prove the concept of helping somebody find a home, helping somebody find a job, helping somebody have a friend, 
And now we're, now we're going places and we can start to tell people our story and hopefully it becomes infectious and other people want to do the same thing. Well, and you, you and so finding your community, that's what it was. I mean, you yeah. started out with coffee with two yeah. gentlemen and this went on for years before yes. you had a house or a property or and so finding your community definitely is step one. And with the Brain Foundation, uh, Cree Deeds came and spoke at one of their fundraisers and, and spoke to donors and said, this is not a problem the government can solve, even if we had unlimited funds. There has to be public-private partnerships. There is a role for faith communities. There is a role for nonprofits. There mm -hmm. is a role for local government. There is a role mm -hmm. for state and even federal government, because mm -hmm. Trudy was talking about the types of loans that she mm -hmm. was getting to purchase these properties. Wow. Yeah. So like, so, so there's so many facets to trying to solve the issue and, but to make it community specific is also critical, critical. Mm -hmm. I don't think there is a, is a one size fits all or a cookie cutter, even with Fairview Lodge, it still has to be adapted to the community, to the available property, to the people you're working with, to your models of finance, Mm -hmm. I mean, if you, it's a daunting task, and thank goodness you were not daunted by the task. Yes, well, you know, and they, the, the Coalition of Community Living, I call the keepers of, of Fairweather Lodge. It's, it's like a trade association. It's kind of a big club, and, and they really support one another's efforts to uh, operate lodges. And so uh, I said, well, where, where and how can I participate? And they said, well, join our lodge coordinator calls once a month. And so I, st I actually was on lodge coordinator calls for about three years talking to them saying, I don't know anything, help me get started. I don't have an agency, <laughs> I'm just an individual. And over our time together, they actually helped me to figure out uh, that what I could do. And um, they, they actually were, I showed them things that they hadn't thought of, which is, that, which is another nice thing about connecting with people from other fields is you learn other ideas that you just wouldn't have thought about by yourself because you're just you're, you're so in, in, into your subject matter that you can't see outside of it. And that's why people need to come back and join us after this break. You're listening to Radio Fairfax. I'm your host, Catherine Reed. We're talking with Corey Trench. And tune in for the second half to find out more about what we're doing in supported housing for those with mental illness. We are Radio Fairfax. Hello, my name's Matthew Moore, the host of the Psychedelic Circus. The circus has moved. I'm on Sunday nights now from 6 to 8 p.m. Join me for the Psychedelic Circus, where the buzz can shake you clean. You get that every time. Reservations at your favorite restaurant. Thanks so much for waiting. Your table's ready. Getting back to the moments we miss starts with getting informed. Ah, perfect, thanks. Get the latest info about COVID-19 vaccines at getvaccineanswers.org. It's up to you. Brought to you by the Ad Council. She can stem. A message brought to you by the Ad Council. Okay, man. This is your time. Maybe you didn't choose this, but you're here now. You're going to go out there and be an all star caregiver. Cook, clean, be there emotionally and physically. You got to dig deeper. Drive them to physical therapy, doctor's appointments, because that's what caregivers do. Don't give up. Show the world that you're tougher than tough. Caregiving is tougher than tough. Find the care guides you need at aarp.org slash caregiving. Brought to you by AARP and the Ad Council. Do airplanes fly? What's in this box? What does this thing do? Kids are curious about everything, including guns. Learn how to store your gun securely and make your home safer at nfamilyfire.org. Brought to you by N Family Fire, Brady and the Ad Council. Welcome back 
to Making Change Radio. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and tonight we're talking with Corey Trench. Corey is the president of the Hope Family Village, which is supported housing in the Williamsburg area for those who are struggling with mental illness, their families, and caregivers. Thank you so much for taking time to be with us and to discuss this really important subject, Corey. I appreciate it, Catherine. Thank you for the opportunity. Well, so we've talked a lot in the first segment about the actual nitty gritty of how do you put together housing to support folks with mental illness. And we haven't spent a whole lot of time talking about the enormous number of people who end up homeless or end up incarcerated because there aren't enough support services to help them at a point at which they could be channeled into something like stable housing. Mm -hmm. So, you know, just, you know, just, you know, you were able to help your son. You're, you're, you had the resources, the mm-hmm. determination to do that. But a lot of a lot of people struggling with mental illness do not have that family structure, mm-hmm. and so they're kind of dependent on a community to come forward with something mm-hmm. that helps to address how to get them on a path back mm-hmm. into the community. Mm-hmm. This is so true. And uh, you know, when we were going to support group. Uh, one of the things about uh, about uh, NAMI and, and what they're able to do is that people come from all walks of life to these, um, these events. Um, we have people riding buses to come in uh, that, that don't have the means to get there. Uh, we have people that are professors, uh, very accomplished people. And, but they, they talk about Typically, the common denominator is getting access to care. And that means, can they get an appointment with their local CSB and get a, a case manager uh, to see them? And, and when will they get that appointment uh, to receive care? And I think that delay that you were talking about earlier with, with Cray Deeds, that is a really tough problem to solve because there are simply not enough doctors, there are not enough therapists, uh, there are not enough services out there t- to access. And it's just like we've fallen behind in that area. And so if there's one thing that we need to do, and, and Monty Mason, uh, our, our senator, was talking about this on the panel, is that we need to encourage more youth to go into the profession of mental health. And I think uh, this generation coming up, um, I guess they call them the Zoomers, they're, they're very aware of mental health. Uh, They're very aware of anxiety, uh, these experiences, uh, maybe in a sense too too aware of it, but that doesn't really matter because you've got to have uh, the ability to be open about your your situation and be able to access a professional to talk to, or at least be able to access another peer who's going through the same thing you are to have a conversation. And I think what Monty was talking about is really the need uh, to, to be more encouraging of people going in the profession and supporting them. And that could be things like, you know, we, we certainly have given uh, loan forgiveness for people going into the teaching profession, you know, as an example. We actually talked to uh, Senator Norman about this when we made our pitch for, for Hope Family Village is that we thought that uh, that should be part of this and that what we would offer is if we're creating a village then we might have some students who are who can live for free in the village while they're they're studying to get their degree. That could we figure out some way of doing that, just as a means of encouraging people to go into this very necessary profession. Well, and that's something that that did come up too, and the lack of facilities and professionals specifically to work with children. So there are not enough juvenile psychiatric and professionals. We talk about the lack of counselors in schools, public mm-hmm. schools. Mm-hmm. Um, the, there's one juvenile facility that houses juveniles in crisis. That's mm-hmm. not enough for the entire Commonwealth of Virginia. Some of mm-hmm. us got lucky in the lottery. I live in Fairfax County and we have a tremendous number of resources here. We have um, the Diversion First program. We have the Maryfield Crisis Resource Center, which is like one of a kind in the whole commonwealth Mm -hmm. that basically Mm -hmm. triages people in a Mm -hmm. mental crisis and diverts them from jail. Um, We have the turning point program that deals with children 14 to 26 
mm. who are experiencing uh, um, their first psychotic episode. You know, like, so Fairfax County has all these things because we benefit from having a lot of resources. We have a tremendous tax base, but there are a hundred and there's 95 counties and 40 cities in the Commonwealth of Virginia. And, you know, Williamsburg has resources. James City County has resources, mm -hmm. but there are plenty of places in Virginia that simply don't. Mm -hmm. So this Which, is true. And, and, you know, what, what do you do in that, in that instance? Well, you know, I, I you know, as you look at state budgets, you know, over the years, um, there'll be an incident that will happen and it'll cause uh, uh, great excitement about putting a lot of money into the budget. And sometimes it materializes and sometimes it doesn't. And, and you know, and the thing is, you always have to advocate for, you know, finishing up a budget and, and doing what they said they promised they were going to do. That's certainly the case and making sure that it's distributed fairly. But I think in the short run, you know, I think what we've done, uh, and we do have access to resources, but you really don't need much to start. I think that's sort of the key thing that I want to suggest to everybody that listens to this is that too often uh, we, we're in this mode where, um, you know, we're waiting for psychiatrists, therapists, we're trying to encourage them, we're trying to wait for budget to, to materialize. But what we should do is just ask ourselves a very simple question. What is it that we can do? Who in our community can we work with that might be thinking the same way we are and might actually be doing something? I can tell you in a little community like Williamsburg, I probably only met 10% of the nonprofits who probably touch what I'm doing. And I know that sounds like a fantastic statement, but you know, if you consider, consider women in crisis, for example, you know, uh, there are organizations that, that deal with that. There's uh, developmental disorders, autism. It just goes on and on and on. And we all have common needs. And I think the first thing to do is just become familiar with each other and, and recognize that we're all caregivers. And, and together, we're a community of caregivers. And so once we know who, who we are, then we're in a position to say, you know, well, what can you do? What can you do? What can you do? And, and then to start doing real projects. And I just want to say that um, because, you know, I actually live right across from the College of William & Mary and I graduated from here. And I've got to give them a lot of credit because we were really looking for, and that was a tremendous resource to us, uh, someone that would help us uh, do some serious research on options uh, that uh, we could employ. And their students were very willing and interested in, you know, in mental illness. And, uh, and they gave back a lot of ideas. I'm just going to give you one simple idea. Uh, I, I didn't have a house, you know, and Tr Trudy in, in the interview that you did with her, she, she's from the real estate profession, so she knew about housing. And I just looked at the rents in our area. I thought there's no way we're going to be able to rent a house. But I was visiting with our center of entrepreneurship and, uh, and, and the leader there said to me, he said, you know, try to think of some simple experiment that you could do that wouldn't cost you anything to t test this idea out. And from that simple idea emerged the notion with a couple of peers that I knew is, why don't we start meeting on Saturdays and having coffee, you know, for one hour and talking about what you want to accomplish with your goals and your career and what I want to accomplish in getting you a place to live. And, and that led to two and a half years of discussions and getting to know one another and helping them find jobs and eventually finding a house. But, and, and that's, but, but you point out something really important. Start where you are, use what you have, and do what you can. For those of you who are just joining us, this is Making Change Radio here on Radio Fairfax. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and we are talking with Corey Trench. She is the president of Hope Family Village, um, a community that supports people struggling with mental illness, their families, and caregivers. So you start with what you have, you find your community, you build people who are stakeholders, correct? You correct. find your stakeholders. Yes, and there are many of them. Um, when we went around and gave uh, presentations about uh, our personal experiences and then what we were doing as a result of it, almost everybody would universally say, wow, you all have some, a great idea in Hope Family Village in Eastern State. There was no one that said, you know, this is a terrible idea and you shouldn't do it. And, um, and you start attracting people as stakeholders who want to know what they can do 
you know, to help you. And, uh, and that's pretty much where we are. I mean, we, we, we know that through Monty and, and Senator Norma, that a, a piece of property is of 25 acres has been set aside with our name on it, Hope Family Village. And it's for 25 families with loved ones living with a serious mental illness and creating a community for them. And it would be a co-housing community. Now everybody's gonna wanna know how can they participate? Well, at one, some point or another, when, when a, a bid is finally accepted for the, for the property and, and we're part of that, um, you know, we will be doing a, a capital fundraising campaign here and reaching out to all our stakeholders that we're working with. And now they can say, oh, I'm contributing to something tangible. Like this is a real project that I can, I can be involved in and uh, is gonna make a difference in our community. But do you th consider how small it was that we started? We started with a couple of guys having coffee in a coffee house, and they wound up living together. And now they've been living together with two other gentlemen for almost two years, successfully implementing this Fairweather Lodge model that I was talking about. So you've got your you've got your best practices. You've got a model, and it's a best practice, and you've shown that it works. Absolutely. So you bring up something really important. The College of William & Mary has been an asset to you. Here in Fairfax, we have George Mason University, and there's a lot of communities that benefit from having a university close at hand for this very reason, that students are interested in research, they're interested in solutions, they're young, they're entrepreneurial, they're innovative, and they've got the time and interest and passion to help. And they wanna help. I, I do think young people really are invested in making the world a better place. That's what they wanna do. You found the, the Eastern State property. You know, we here in Fairfax City, there's an affordable housing project that's coming together through Fairfax Presbyterian Church, who's giving part of their acreage to build 10 townhomes. Hmm. But they're, le but they're, but they're um, leasing the land to this collaboration. And I'm like, you know, there's so many different ways it could be done, but you hmm. kind of have to be innovative and you kind of have to use what you have at hand. So I would suggest, too, that, you know, look, you know, people who have property that can look at this and say, how could we collaborate with community stakeholders to set aside property? That is one thing people can do all across Virginia that just just starting to ask the questions, who has something we need to make this work? So it's so true. And, and you think that you don't have anything. That's the funny part about it. You think, well, there's nothing here or no one is going to free it up. Uh, you know, I was listening to the, the uh, Trudy's interview. Uh, we had a very similar situation in which we had uh, a family member who had means, had lost their loved one to a very tragic situation. And he wanted to be involved in contributing to something that was going to be innovative and was going to be thoughtful, uh, maybe didn't have the answer, but people were committed to doing something locally. And without his funding, we wouldn't have been able to uh, support our, 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 our lodge members. We also found a landlady who, who was renting other houses, who was a psychiatrist, and we had just simply written an article about what we were doing with the Eastern State property and uh, talked about Fairweather Lodge. And she called us, she said, I have a house and it was affordable. It was something we could afford, but she was making it affordable. That's the truth of the matter. She believed in what we were doing. Just simply by knowing about us, uh, you know, we were able to get these guys in a house and get them started. And, and everybody can sort of wrap their arms around the joy and the success that goes along with it. And if there is a, a, a down moment, a bad moment, you know, you deal with it together. And this is the other thing. We don't walk away with our problems. We deal with them, you know, on the spot. And we, we do the best we can. And, and I, will, I will tell you, Catherine, that after two years of these guys living together and two and a half years of them meeting before that, we haven't had one hospitalization. And one, one way of, of extending resources that are precious is that you don't access them uh, you know, because you don't need them. You're able to provide the kind of support that people need simply by creating that community that we're talking about. And so that allows those those resources that are needed by other people much more needy. And, and when you're talking about children, this is huge. And, and I'm we're certainly aware that there are just not enough facilities and treatment to take care of them. Well, maybe that's where our resources need to go. 
Oh, I, I agree a hundred percent. When you can solve one problem and create solutions, you're freeing up resources that are in short supply for those who more critically need them. Mm -hmm. Because when you have a deficit of professionals and facilities to provide these services, then yeah, there's just not enough to go around. Someone gets left out. And this is a something we need to recognize again, as a community. For those of you who are just joining us, this is Making Change Radio here on Radio Fairfax. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and the change maker we're talking with today is Corey Trench, and he has developed an idea to solve a problem that specifically hits his family, but not just his family, the families of so many others in the Williamsburg community. And part of the idea in bringing him on to talk about this is to inspire everyone else to think of what you can do to figure out how to solve an unmet need in your own community. There's simply not enough housing for people who are capable of living productive lives in our communities safely. And in, until we, as a community, come together and figure out how we bring our resources to the table, there won't ever be, there won't ever be. The government is not going to solve the problem of supported housing for people with mental illness. So, so Corey has taken the bull by the horns and he's, he's come up with a solution and he's making it work. So moving forward, so you've got a capital campaign that you've got to undertake. You're working with your state legislator, Senator Monty Mason. You've spoken with Senator Norman, like you're, 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 you're kind of pulling the levers that you can in your local and state government. I would encourage people too to go to hopefamilyvillage.org. That is the website for Home Fa Hope Family Village is hopefamilyvillage.org. Go there to see information. There's a blog there. There's a background story there. Um, but so tell me, you know, as you, as you move forward, what are your kind of the next big challenges to get from where you are to where you want to be? So I think the big challenge for us is to figure out you know, how to grow fair with a lodge, sort of separate and apart from Hope Family Village. And we have, uh, you know, four, well, we've had between three and four males living in a house in a regular neighborhood together successful, successfully. And we recently um, had a booth at a, uh, it was a race or run for mental health. And we had a young woman who came up to us who was 31 and she said, you know, I've been living with depression uh, for the last 10 years and people don't understand, are you going to have a house for women? And so uh, what was funny about it is we were just talking about that, that we need to keep growing our model. And this is something that, you know, I, I want to talk, you know, with, with Trudy about and, and what she's done in Northern Virginia, because, you know, we want to try to find another house, you know, find other people that would like to live together. And I think, you know, that's, sort of the prerequisite, you have to be willing to live with other people and to sort of develop, you know, somewhat of a reserve fund that makes it affordable for them to live there. Now, we're not using outside sources yet um, other than just private donations. And so that's what we've done. We built a reserve fund for each house to try to keep our rents low. And, uh, and I work with the residents on, you know, if you were to leave our house and live on your own, this is what it would cost. So we try to get our rent up to something that they would be used to paying and, and teach them how to manage their, their finances. So that's one thing that we want to do. We want to grow Fairweather Lodge in our community. I'd really like to see other places in our state do exactly the same thing. And I, I recently advanced the notion that why don't we have 100 houses uh, in, in Virginia that do something similar to what we're doing? You know, I think as you said earlier, it's not, it doesn't have to be one model. It, it has, but it has to be something. It has to be something where we're, we're providing the housing is needed. For our Hope Family Village uh, project, we, we have been working with one developer in particular, but we understand that there are others that are interested in developing this 300 acres of property, and they've set aside 25 acres for us. And so one of the things we're doing is we're reaching out to families now who would be interested in, in living in our village. And we've got a newsletter that we just put out. We've got a, a list of people. Uh, some of them are, are outside our immediate area here um, and because we know the need is is great. So we're going to be developing a constituency that's interested, you know, in helping us design and, and build this village. 
will probably retain uh, one of the top experts in, in co-housing in the world, actually. And we've been talking to her about what we wanted to do. And she's just very intrigued, our, our adaptation of co-housing to mental health care. So uh, we're going to be uh, accessing her expertise to help us, you know, work through uh, developing our community and figuring out, you know, what, what, it, what it should look like. And uh, we're going to be doing that, I expect, sometime over the next six months to year. So it's, it's coming up fast here. So one thing I think we need to address is the fact that m many times we don't discuss these things because of the stigma around mental illness. It's not something people talk about. Somebody might have a loved one in their family struggling with mental illness and they do not share it, even with colleagues, even with close mm -hmm. friends. They mm -hmm. don't talk about it. So it seems to me the first thing we have to do is, is stop this nonsense that a mental illness is different from diabetes or heart disease. Because the fact of the matter is there is a higher rate of recovery for mental illness than there is for heart disease and diabetes, actually. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So we have to reorient the way people think about people with mental illness. They're not all dangerous. They are not all criminals. And it is not a hopeless endeavor to work with people with mental illness because there is a chance that they will recover and move on to have lives that are, you know, giving something to the community in which we all live, that they have lives that, that they aspire to live and that all of us can be part of making sure that there's a place in our communities for people who are trying to strive to get to that place. And the kind of housing you're talking about is part of that journey. It's not even necessarily a state, you know, it's not, it's not the end game so much as there's a place for people to be when they need to be there. So uh, when uh, we first held a, a workshop about Fairweather Lodge in, in Williamsburg in 2017, uh, Monty Mason came to that event and, and uh, we had a panel and it was people that had been living in a Fairweather Lodge uh, and, and, the, and their experience from, from living together. We have people that are very accomplished in our society. Uh, and I can think of one in particular that never lost his job with the Department of Transportation in Pennsylvania, even though he had been hospitalized for over six months and, and, and then moved into a, a lodge for the next several years uh, to sort of get his life back. And, and to give you an idea of his accomplishments, he's in charge of like all licenses for, this, for the state of Pennsylvania. And he says it's a great tribute to his organization that they didn't fire him, they kept him on. But when someone like that tells their story, this gives hope to everybody else. And they're our most effective messengers, those who come out and tell their story of recovery. It's fine for people like me to talk from a caregiver's perspective and say, geez, this is what it's like for a family and have them try to understand and be empathetic with what we're going and going through and to sort of paint a picture of how our community uh, is a stakeholder in that. But when somebody comes out and talks about their illness and is very open about it, and then they talk about how they've recovered and how they're thriving, this gives everybody else hope. And so peers, uh, in my mind, they're the secret to the future and, and having creating a platform for them to come out and speak and tell their stories gives everybody else hope and helps them realize that, yes, these are special people in our society that we just don't pay that much attention to. And it's sad. It is. And the fact of the matter is, is that our community needs to understand that we don't know people struggling necessarily with mental illness. Um, for those of you just joining us, this is Making Change Radio here on Radio Fairfax. I'm your host, Catherine Reed, and we are talking with Corey Trench. He is a parent. He is the founder of Hope Family Village, and he is trying to shine a light on how we can be stakeholders in our own communities for creating a safe space for people who need supported housing to be in our communities and to work their way forward. And so I will mention that the Turning Point program that I spoke about before that works with children 14 to 26, part of their program, and it's not a residential program, it's a, it's a sort of an outpatient program, but one of the features of that program is they have professionals come and talk to those kids about their own struggles with mental illness in exactly the way you are talking about. 
Oh, they neat. are lawyers. They are medical doctors. They are professionals mm -hmm. of every every stripe. And they come and they talk to these young people to demonstrate to them that you can deal with your mental health issues just like you would deal with diabetes or high blood pressure. And you can go on to have a family, a spouse, a career, to be mm -hmm. a giving, contributing member of your society. But I think the larger community needs to hear that too, because I don't think the average person is hearing that either. I do not think we are hearing these stories of recovery and the, mm -hmm. and the wonderful things that, that, that people contribute to our, to our communities. Well, this is absolutely true and why I'm grateful that uh, you're doing this interview with me and, and you interview other people who are in the, are operating in the space because that's how we get our story out. Um, you, you just can't get it from a newspaper. <laughs> you, you can't get it from a, a short story even. I would argue that it takes a documentary practically to really wrap your head around what's going on here. And... Um, and I would say this, the people that I have met that struggle with mental illness, and I count my son among them, it takes a great deal of courage to continue to live. And this is a very important thing that I'm saying because uh, there is a purpose for their lives. And sometimes they just need to be shown very gently and helped to see what it is. And, and that's why we all need to be more aware of this. If we're wanting to av avoid some sort of tragedy down the road that you, know, you were articulating earlier, then we need to know and accept people that are different. And it's just, again, I see these things and I didn't before, I was the average man. I did not see that. I, did. You know, I realized that there's just a tremendous value in our society that we've neglected and it's time to give them a voice. And I, and I think that's part of what I hope we're doing in our community. And yes, and that I was so delighted to meet you. I was so delighted that we were able to work on a panel together for the League of Women Voters. And I'm glad that I could take your message and bring it to a wider audience because, because you come from an experience that maybe not all of our listeners have ever had in their lives. And yet if we want communities where everyone can thrive, if we want to honor people for the unique individuals that they are, then this is what we need to do. We need to be a stakeholder. We need to be part of the solution in our own communities. Thank you so much, Corey Trench. Thank you to our listeners. This has been Making Change Radio every Thursday night at 9 p.m. here on Radio Fairfax.